Well, welcome to Just Have a Think, and I'm very happy to be here with Professor Peter Wadhams. Peter, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, to just for the, for the handful of people who may not be aware of your body of work, can you give us just a sort of summary of, uh, of what you've been up to and how you got into it and, and what the main emphasis of your work has been over the years? Mm. Well, I got into um, Arctic sea ice research kind of by accident. I mean, I always wanted to be an oceanographer, partly because my family had been sailors, and uh, but I was very keen on physics at school, so a way of combining physics and going to sea would, was be to become an oceanographer. So when I first graduated, I, I got a job on an oceanographic ship for a year, and the Canadians were doing the first circumnavigation of North and South America. It's still the only one that's ever been done by the a ship called the Hudson. I really wanted to, to be a traditional oceanographer, which means you sail around in the tropics and some uh -huh. But uh, unfortunately, I got, I got sold on sea ice because we went down to the Antarctic and worked in, in, uh, there in, in, in ice-covered ice seas. And then we came up back through the Northwest Passage and had a very interesting time getting stuck in the ice. Right. And so in those days, there was very few people working on sea ice. I mean, I think... Uh, the first conference I went to on it were, I think the entire population of the world of sea ice researchers went to it. It was in, wow. in Iceland. And they hadn't had a conference on sea ice for 13 years. And so the whole, everybody went and there was only 80 people. That was the whole world population wow. of sea ice researchers. Uh, so I was the kind of official uh, university scientist really as, a, attached to the Navy whenever they sent an sent a, a a submarine to the Arctic, and you had a, I, I gather from reading your book that there was a there was a, a dicey experience on one of the mm. submarines, a near death experience by the sound of it. That, was, that, that sounds terrifying. Well, it, it was nasty, and, and I came closest to death, I think, on that voyage. That was in two thousand seven, and it was a submarine, uh, the Tireless, as a submarine needs to renew its oxygen, and normally you have an electrolyzer which generates uh, oxygen, and the problem in the Arctic is the electrolyzer tends to freeze up. Uh, and so as a backup, they always take big slabs of material, which they call candles. They're actually a, a, a slab of potassium chloride if mm. the electrolyzer freezes up. So they were using them and um, it, it blew up and that killed a couple of sailors and, oh. and uh, started a fire and uh, the, the whole submarine filled with smoke and uh, we had to and they couldn't get at the compartment that the sailors were in because when they, they fell down, when they fell, they fell against the door. So uh. then they had to flood that compartment. So it was pretty uh, close. We came pretty close to, to doom there. Mm. And uh, we had to use breathing masks for a couple of hours. And we were under the ice, so we had to try and find a way up through the ice. Um, so that was the closest I think I've come to death in mm. the Arctic and it was it doing something which was supposedly the safest, Safe. the most comfortable thing you can do. Goodness me. <laughs> so what, what, um, what do you think, what's been the extent of ice loss since you've been, I mean you've been looking at it for what, 40 odd years? Yes, or? yes it's, it's huge. I mean the, the, we can always measure the, the loss of area of ice from satellites because they can see the difference between white and dark yeah so the, the it was known that the ice area was shrinking by about three percent a decade some some low rate of shrinkage uh, but it, it gradually meant that the summer ice started to shrink back from the coastlines of the arctic so instead of even the summer ice cover filling the arctic ocean it was it was shrinking back a little bit so r allowing a the existence of a northwest passage and a northern sea route, mm. if you're lucky. Um, but then the rate started to accelerate and nobody had looked at actually how thick the ice was, although it's pretty obvious really, it's, if the ice shrinks and it has to melt and, it, and if it's going to melt it's got to get thin yes. first. <laughs> so yes. the average thickness should be going down. So I, was, so I started doing submarine, asking the, the, the Navy to take the submarine over the same track each time and so we did two tracks that were identical over the, the Arctic Ocean from Greenland to the Pole um, in 1976 and 1987 so 11 year 
gap. That gap resulted in a 15% decrease in thickness. That was So I wrote that up and that was the first re- report on thinning of ice in the Arctic. But the 15% was just a starter because then the next voyage we did in the 90s um, it was down to it was up to forty three percent loss of ice, wow. loss of thickness, um, or loss of thickness, yeah. um, and that it's more it's at least fifty percent now loss of thickness. But because of the shrinkage as well, yeah. it's it's three quarters of the ice has gone. Mm. The downward trend is so strong that it really is going to get rid of all the the summer ice very soon, and mm. it won't come back. Can you give us a layman's sort of snapshot of? why that's such a dramatic uh, forcer of, of, the, of the climate issue? Uh, yes, well, when you have sea ice, especially if, it's f- if there's fresh snow on top, then it's albedo, which is the fraction of solar radiation that's reflected straight back into space, is about 80 or 90%. But open water is less than 10%. So if you, it's the biggest transition in albedo on the planet is, is if you have ice, sea ice, and you take it away, or snow, and take that away. And that means a huge amount of extra energy absorbed by either the sea or the land. The, just the loss of sea ice is equivalent to adding a quarter to the uh, warming effect of the CO2 we're adding to the atmosphere. And then also it's, we're finding that the area of snow in the northern lands, the, Ar- the, the Arctic and the subarctic, that's going down and it's gone down by about 6 million square kilometres. Okay. So that's a, as big a loss, or an even bigger loss, than the loss of sea ice. Mm. So if you add the two effects together, it's now more like 50%, a 50% increase in the rate of warming just due to the loss of snow and ice. So, yeah. so it's already the case that, that if, you, uh, if you kind of uh, switch on, start your SUV and emit two molecules of CO2 from the tailpipe, then nature or or arctic change is giving you another molecule as well to add to the effect which is due to the retreat of sea ice mm. which isn't reflected necessarily in these concentration pathways that the ICC uses yes that, no, the, IPCC the, the IPCC is very slack in in incorporating all these feedbacks they they tend not to do it very well and and so their predictions tend to be complacent i think mm is the word, or mm. false is another word. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the, this, this one is, I think, one of the alarming ones because um, other, other feedbacks are things that may or may not happen, like um, methane loss. But, but albedo is, is, is definitely happening because we're losing area of snow and ice, yeah. replacing it so with that's darkness. Just a scientific um, fact. So in, even in the IPCC report, they've said that the Arctic has warmed by 1.9 degrees cel- hmm. Celsius in the, hmm. just in the last 30 years. And that's, that's reducing the differential between the, the mid-latitude warmer regions and the Arctic hmm. cold region, which, as I understand it, is, is having an effect on the jet stream. Um, it, it is an effect where it, it implicates sea ice and Arctic warming very strongly. And the, the person who originated the theory is Jennifer Francis mm. uh, from Rutgers University. And most people agree with her analysis now that, that what's happening is the Arctic's warming about four times as fast as the rest of the planet. So the difference in temperature between the Arctic air mass and tropical air masses is, is getting less. Because the temperature difference has gone down, the driving force for the jet stream is less. So the jet stream slowed down, and as it slows down, instead of being a straight line, it goes into lobes, north-south lobes. Okay. Like a, it's like a river flowing over a flat estuary. It, it tends to meander. So you've got a meandering jet stream, and with a, with a meandering, it means that, that Arctic air is carried down to much lower latitudes than it should get to. And then in between, there's regions where tropical air is carried to much higher latitudes. So Europe um, seemed to have escaped this, but at the beginning of this year we had this beast from the east, which yes. was exactly this, this thing, that you had extremely cold air covering Europe and extremely warm air in the Arctic. The Arctic was 30 degrees warmer wow. than normal. In fact, it was above zero at the North Pole. And the problem of, with all that um, is these extreme events will keep happening now because that's the way the jet streams become. We're not going to escape from either extreme heat or extreme cold events during, during the winter. So we, 
it's not weather, extreme weather we're getting, it's extreme climate, that, mm. that the climate has changed, uh, and it's changed in an, in an unpredictable way. The, these events, you can't, you can't predict them, but they have a big impact on mid-latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's exactly the place where most of the world's food is grown. So therefore you have, you have revolts and uprisings and, and warfare even, and you find the years in which food prices are very high are years in which you have the Arab revolt and the big uprisings in Tunisia and all over the Middle East.